Tonight, we're going to discuss sustainable energy, the environmental impact of what we plug in, how we as individuals can make simple changes and how we power our lives that both help save the planet and save us money. We're joined tonight by James Owen, the Executive Director of Renew Missouri, Katie Panic, Senior Products Manager of Renewables at Evergy, Ken Reed, the President of Heartland Renewable Energy Society, Nick Voris, Senior Manager of Electrification Projects with Energy, and Drew Torkelson, Lead Electrification Project Manager of Evergy. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Thanks for, having for having us. us. Thank you. Absolutely. So we all know that the climate crisis is a series of cause and effects, the greenhouse gases in our atmosphere are absorbing solar heat and causing global warming, which is the increase in the average of the Earth's surface temperature. And this global warming is causing climate change, which is long-term changes in the planet's weather patterns. And these weather patterns are causing major weather disasters, hurricanes, floods, droughts, wildfires, you know, every day in the news, we see something new. The weather disasters are costing us billions of dollars in lives and property damage. And the way we fight them is by stopping their root cause, and that's reducing greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. Now, the EPA has done a really great job of breaking down global greenhouse gas emissions by sector. They characterize 10% of all global, global greenhouse gas emissions as other energy. And that other energy is the greenhouse gases created by digging up and transporting fossil fuels to power plants. Another 6% char characterizes buildings. These are the greenhouse gases emitted by buildings that are generating their own power and heat. You know, your home's gas furnace and gas range in a kitchen are examples of this. And then there's the 25% of global greenhouse gases emitted by power plants that are burning fossil fuels. If we add all this together, that's a total of 46% of all global greenhouse gases em that are emitted by electricity in heat production. In short, moving to sustainable energy solutions have the potential of eliminating 46% of our global greenhouse gas emissions. Research at the Drawdown Project found that the top two solutions to reverse greenhouse gas emissions are onshore wind turbines and utility scale solar, in other words, renewable energy. So all sustainable energy sources reach us as electricity. So tonight we're going to talk about how we as individuals can prepare for and plug into sustainable energy by electrifying our homes. This lowers our carbon footprint, which is great for the planet, but often this also reduces our monthly utility bill and makes our homes more comfortable. So let's talk about electrification of our home. Modern electric homes can increase your comfort and save you money. And if you're getting your electricity from coal power power plants, electrification can still reduce your carbon footprint. If you're getting your um, home's electricity from renewable, then you can actually reduce your carbon footprint to zero. And the home uses gas in several places. If you have a gas furnace, you're heating your home with gas. If you have a gas hot water heater, you're heating your water with gas. In your kitchen, if you gas range, that's burning fossil fuels. You may be using gas, gas appliances in your yard, your lawnmower, your blowers, those kind of things, and those can all be electrified. And then there's also things that can just reduce your electric consumption, like LED light bulbs, which have, have a major impact over um, the traditional incandescent or your CFL compact fluorescent light bulbs. But let's start with heating and cooling right now. And one of the, the latest trends and one of the most efficient systems out there is the ductless mini split. And th this is a heat pump that connects to a heat exchanger in every room. So you have multiple zones in your house. And instead of ductwork running through your house, you basically have flexible tubing and some electricity. So they're very cost efficient to install and also have very high efficiency in terms of carbon. Uh, Drew, you've got some experience with this. Can you talk about the ductless mini splits? Yeah, sure. Um, you did a good job of setting that up. They are they are very efficient. They're, one of the things I really like about them, they're very versatile. Uh, they can be as, as installed just using up a little bit of wall space. You don't have to deal with any flue pipe or, or uh, duct work. Uh, so so they, you put them in there, they whisper quiet. Uh, quite often. Um, so you can have that zoning control. You're talking about putting multiple units in. Uh, you can have zoning control where each room is set to a spe specific temperature where everybody's comfortable. 
and and the heat pump application they're using newer technology without getting too deep into this is a, a variable speed compressor that actually extracts heat from the outdoors a whole lot better than than the heat pumps of the of the 1980s so they do a really good job even down to what you and I as humans we consider very cold temperatures they do a good job uh, so they're and they're also an excellent application for that hot or cold spot like a, a sunroom that just doesn't get cool enough in the summer or that that second floor bedroom that's always always cold they're a great application for that mm -hmm. I'm, I'm seeing ranges um, and this is technology that's been running in europe and asia for like 50 years i think 90 yeah. percent of all homes in europe are running these ductless mini slits this is nothing new it's just now finally getting to the united states um, I've seen specs that say the heat pumps are efficient from like negative 20 Fahrenheit up to 120. I mean, obviously a much wider range of efficiency than we used to have. Absolutely. We were a little slow on the uptake on these, but but uh, that heat, that ductless mini split uh, usage is, uh, it's growing leaps and bounds yearly. There's, there's a significant increase in the, uh, of people on the uptake on, on this, using this. Another thing that kind of fascinates me about the concept of ductless, because there's inherent problems with home heating ducts. Um, I mean, I've, I've read specs up to 40, 50% heat loss from the ducts. So rather than the heating, cooling, getting to your room, you know, to the zone you're trying to deliver it to, a lot of that is radiated out of the ducts before it gets to. So you're, you're wasting, you know, 40, 60% of your energy in that system. And you know, there's also the efficiency of insulation. If you're building a new home, you, you spend a fair amount of money, material and labors installing all that duct work. And I've also heard people talk about the advantages of eliminating all the allergens. You know, there's kind of a whole industry of cleaning your duct work to remove the dust and the mites and the allergens that live in your home. If we don't have those ducts to start with, that's, clean, that's creating a healthier, cleaner environment plus saving us money, plus reducing our carbon footprint. So it really seems like a win-win solution. Has anybody else had any experience with, with this technology or thoughts? Well, what about on-demand hot water? That's another area, your hot water heater, your tank downstairs that's, you know, could be electric, but could be also be burning fossil fuels. It's heating this tank of water and keeping it warm, whether you use it or not. So there's there's a lot of heat loss there and heat loss through the pipes, getting the hot water to your shower. I think most of us have experienced turning on the hot water in our share and then standing there and waiting for, you know, all the cold water in that hot pipe to run through. So we finally get some hot water. My understanding is the, the distributed on demand hot water heaters that are located you know, by your shower or under a sink, I mean, they're gonna give you instant hot water. Is that true, Drew? Yeah, those are, those are great applications. There's nothing worse than trying to wash your hands with warm water and you finally just give up and, and use cold water and about the time you finish rinsing, you're starting to get some warm water. So when you locate the distributed water heating like under a sink for example it only has a short run of pipe a, a couple feet to to go to get to you so you get essentially instantaneous hot water uh but much quicker and and it only runs when the water is flowing that's a, a huge part of the energy efficiency of that is when there's no water flow it isn't sitting there like you described earlier on a tank just uh percolating all day long trying to uh maintain a temperature for when it is needed. So, it just, yeah, so you're only heating the water when you need it. You're not you heating only... that tank downstairs when nobody's home. Exactly. And again, I, I also think about when you're building a new house or remodeling a house, that's just a single run of, of copper or pipe to the destination instead of the two runs we have now. And right now we're running both a hot pipe and a cold pipe all the way across the house. It seems like there'd be some efficiencies to just running that one pipe to the destination and then splitting it there to have your hot water and cold water feeds. Yeah, they certainly uh, with the fluctuating price of copper or, or uh, a lot of people are using PEX because of copper's price, um, you know, you could, there's could be significant savings there in, in your building cost. Uh, so what about the kitchen? We, 
Go ahead, Ken. I was going to jump in a second and play devil's advocate for one minute. There is <laughs> two types of electric water heaters that are on demand. There's ones that are small, like give you instant hot water at your sink so you can have hot water for, you know, like tea or a quick way to get hot water for soups. And then there's whole house instantaneous or, or continuous flow, whatever you want to, there's different names, but the whole idea is that like, like uh, Drew was saying is they only come on when there's a pressure drop, they sense when water's running, but there's also a downside, which I think Drew could talk about in that to do a whole house worth of heating of water, you're talking about a significant electrical demand. And my understanding is electric utilities are not necessarily interesting in so maybe we can clarify this for the, the, the audience here. <clears throat> a, a, and a spot water heater by your kitchen sink might be a 110, and I don't know how many amps, but it won't be a huge draw. But a whole house one might be 60 amps, and it might be uh, uh, 20 kW, 30 kW, which a regular electric water heater, the reason it stores water is it has a small 4.5 kW element, then it heats over yeah. the course of time, whereas if you're using water immediately, it has to have a lot of, of energy applied. So what is the utility stance on the large 20, 30 KW instantaneous water heaters, if I may ask? Well, I don't know our, our official stance, uh, but you know, on the whole home, I'll call them tankless water heaters. Um, th they can be electric or gas and, and yeah, you, to, provide instantaneous heat you have to put a lot of energy into it whether it be gas or electricity so it may uh it, you really need to just have your conversation with your licensed professional to see which option is going to be better for you i, th I think the whole home tank list may come in if you're retrofitting a home and you yeah. know a a simple solution is you take out that electric or that gas tank and you put in a central tank list um, that's going to be more burn more electricity. If we're going to talk optimal efficiency, then I think the distributed solutions, the smaller ones, you know, and you know, if you've got a bath, two bathrooms backed up to each other, or a bathroom near the kitchen, that doesn't mean that those two rooms couldn't share a unit. But you could have two or three smaller units around the house that are going to plug into the 110 outlet, so they're burning less electricity. Plus, you're getting away from those large pipe runs of, of hot water pipe. You know, one of the, the comfort advantages of the distributed is that instant hot water when you turn on the shower. If you've got a tankless unit in the basement, better for the environment, you know, we're getting away from the fossil fuels and, you know, there may be some cost savings or not depending on you know, the electric loads, but you still got that huge run of hot water pipe that's gonna have to be drained out. So that means the thing is running longer than it needs to. So really the most efficient solutions, and I think the most comfortable is the smaller units placed under the sink besides the shower. So two or three smaller units in the house is probably the way I would go. You, you um, can I, supplement. I know I put, put, I go ahead. I was gonna say you can supplement your existing tank type or, or existing whole house water heater with this in an area that, that's given you uh, a long delay to get your hot water. It's a nice little solution you can do now. Absolutely. I was going to say, I, I had um, my mother's house and she'd added another little bathroom. And rather than running, you know, long pipe runs to this, we just did a single pipe run and then put a small, I think it only cost like $100 for a little small on demand hot water heater under that bathroom sink. And that ran both the tub and the, the sink. So very efficient, very easy to install. Let's jump over to kitchen. The other place that we typically see gas would be our, our gas ranges. You know, and as a, as a chef, the advantages of gas obviously are that instant heat control, and you know, you, you really can produce better food. But recently, I've I've moved to induction cooktops, and I've been reading a lot about them. So I went out and bought a little portable unit, and I'm I'm really amazed at how well they control food. I mean, it's just like cooking with gas instant heat on and off. You know, if, if we think about the old electric ranges with the coils, they heat up using electricity and cook your food, but it takes that coil a, a while to get warm. And then when you turn that down, you know, your food's done, you turn that down, it takes that coil a while to cool off so your food keeps cooking. 
and you, you know just kind of have a problem with that because it you know, just takes away control, makes it harder to cook. These induction units that are using a magnetic field to heat the iron in your pots and pans, and this works with stainless steel pans and the cast iron pans. If you have a 100% aluminum pan, that won't work, so you might have to shift some of your cookware. But it gives you instant heat on and off, just like a gas, and over 90% of the energy goes into your food. Now you compare that to electric range and I think the, the rating is 60% of the energy actually gets into your food. The rest of it's radiated away from the stove. And if you're burning with gas, only 40% of the energy reaches your food. The rest of it's radiated into the room. With induction, it's just heating the pan. So all of the energy is going into the pan and cooking your food. It's really cool technology. Do you have exposure to that, Drew? Yeah, a little bit. Um... I, I really like the quickness and, and one of the arguments on use, using gas uh, was that controllability where I can turn the flame down and 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 I'm going to stop heating and and that in, induction really does the exact same thing. I'd like to drive that home is you once you turn it down, the the, the uh, heat source is, is gone uh, and that gives you a good good control in addition to uh, that instantaneous heating up and down that gives you good control. You're eliminating flame, so it's it's one of the safer ways to cook. Um, and I have seen somewhere where they talked about it boiled water in less than half the time the, than a gas. So that'd be be interesting to use your 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 uh, home unit to try. Yeah, yeah, and I've actually seen stats on that. Um, I, I think the the gas electric units, and there was some some group that did a study measuring how long it took to reach boiling point with like six cups of water and, and the gas electric were coming in at like nine, 10 minutes and the um, induction was taking around three. So almost three times faster. And the oh. other thing that, that we need to point out on the induction is it's very safe. Since it's only heating the pan, the cooked surface is not hot at all. Um, I've seen demonstrations where they have like a piece of paper Often it's a dollar bill just to be impressive that they'll put a dollar <laughs> bill between the pan and the cooktop and then they boil water in that pan and, you know, the paper doesn't catch fire. And I know from my own experience, boiling things over, since the cooktop's not hot, it, it, you know, it doesn't burn and stick to the cooktop. So it makes my cleanup a lot easier. Cost wise, um, you know, this little portable hot plate I have that has all these features, I think I spent $70 for that. And, you know, I checked Amazon a little while ago and you're, we're seeing induction units for like $50. So it's a very cheap investment to reduce your carbon footprint and become very energy efficient in the kitchen. You start with a hot plate, discover you love it, and then you can consider the big built-ins. So that, that's a good solution too. The other thing that I think we can all do instantly is move to LED light bulbs. Uh, Drew, do you have numbers on those? Well, I mean, LED light bulbs, like you said, is something you, you probably can and should do right right away. I mean, the, with the 80 plus percent energy efficiency versus an incandescent uh, bulb, uh, plus you get to have 25,000 operating hours on it compared to an average of 1,000 for a standard bulb. Um, I have a, a bulb in my going down the stairway that's that's really hard to get to and put in an LED bulb and I don't have to worry about it for seven or eight years and as, as opposed to changing it out every year. Uh, that's that's a huge, that's actually a safety thing for me. Um, you know, one of the things on LEDs that I, I like that is compared to CFL, the compact, compact fluorescence, uh, there, there is no um, mercury in them at all. Uh, so that's that's a, a big deal to me. Mercury disposal is something that I, we have a hard time getting our hand hand on as just a society because it's it's hard to do, you know, proper disposal of that. Absolutely. I think most but, people using those C CFLs are just throwing them in the landfill, which is not good for you know, our right. health or the environment. One, one thing I've noticed is the manufacturers are doing a lot better job of, of describing the... Um, LEDs now, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll call it warm white or bright white or, or um, you know, 60 watt equivalent, things that we understand as, a, a, as an incandescent light bulb society. Uh, you know, when, before when they were just putting the, uh, 
the color rating, the Kelvin rating on there, it was it was Greek. So uh, I, I've seen them do a lot better job. They're even coloring the boxes. You know, a bright white might be a pure white, and a, a soft white might have a more of a yellower tint to the box. So it's really they're really helping us out as consumers and the price is coming down to where it's it's not quite to parity but it's real close well as you said they last so much longer so it's just like we've exceeded parity you know what an incandescent's gonna the 60 watts gonna cost you like a buck a you buck, spend yeah. two three dollars for an led so you're spending two three times as much but it's gonna last 25 times as long so you're yeah, saving money a standard bulb would be about what 10 or 12 dollars a year to burn the yeah. same time as that dollar so yeah yeah so you but i i typically hear that you would get a seven watt led to produce the same amount of light as a 60 watt incandescent so you know you're you're seeing a almost almost a one to ten savings ratio there in terms of yeah. your monthly electric bills well and bob so, you, you mentioned the safety factor with the uh, with the stove i mean any of us yeah. who grew up with incandescence in the house as children we can attest to uh you know incandescence burning pretty bright i know i wasn't the only kid who touched a bulb <laughs> when i was when, you know uh, when i was young and these leds i mean part of the reason why they are so energy efficient is they're not burning off a bunch of heat like those incandescents are we we'll bring that up. Was... Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was bringing up the heat. Uh, reminded me that, especially your can lights. You all know what I mean. The bulbs are kind of recessed in the in the ceiling. Those things uh, on a regular incandescent just generate a huge amount of heat. I think eighty percent comes out into the uh, in twenty percent light, eighty percent heat. Um, it can make a difference in the temperature of of your home and. Uh, a definite uh, temperature in, in your, say your, your kitchen, if you have a concentration of these can lights and you switch to LED, um, we actually had a, in my house, if it was over 95 degrees, we'd lose control of the temperature in that, that corner of the house where all these can lights were when we had them on, but we switched to LEDs and we've been able to maintain even on the hottest of days now. And so it's it's a significant savings. So you're saving on your HVAC cost as well. Sounds like a good solution. And I think with Christmas coming up and gifts, um, you know, where if you're looking for a gift that's kind of climate conscious and such, you know, maybe, I mean, it's kind of seems silly, but it's better than socks or a tie. Maybe buy some LEDs for somebody and get them to make that change. Or if you want to invest a little bit more, some of these, see these single hot plate type induction cooktops, I think that would be a great gift. You know, 50, 70 bucks and kind of introduce a person to just how well those things cook. Let's jump over. I mean, that's kind of all, all the gas fuel items in the home, but let's jump over to our car, which can be charged at home. Nick, you want to talk a little bit about EV charging stations in the house? Sure. Yeah. When it comes to charging an EV in the home, you really have two options. And one is to plug it in like you would a hairdryer. And I use hairdryer as the example, because if you plug in your car through a 120 volt outlet, you are going to pull about as much uh, amperage as you would a hairdryer that's operating on high. And that'll, that'll certainly get your car charged eventually, but you're looking at maybe four to six miles of range per hour that you would achieve via that method. So an alternative, a much more advantageous alternative from a few different angles is to charge uh, what we call level two charging. And that is to use 240 volt, the higher voltage in your available in your home to use that to charge your car. And, and, and you can achieve you know, 20, 25 even miles of range per hour using that 240 volt charge infrastructure in your house versus the 120. I've seen um, units that you could actually plug in. This is like an extension cord, but you're plugging it into your 220 dryer outlet mm -hmm. and connecting your car. Are those effective? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, I think if you were to ask the average Tesla driver, which I am not, but uh, we've talked to several, obviously in our service territory, and if you, um, they by and large, charge that very way at home. They, they plug so into what is essentially a dryer outlet. Yeah, so you don't necessarily need to get a fancy recharging unit installed. You can just you don't. You know, get the car right. and plug it into your dryer. 
Yeah, you know, the onboard capabilities that EVs have for managing charging uh, are only getting better year after year. So if you are, for example, on a time of use rate where you get a steep discount in the cost of your electricity, if you're using the electricity between, say, noon and 6 a.m., well, you can literally program your car, plug your car in, but program your car to only charge, you know, turn the charge on at 1 a.m. and kick it off at 6 a.m. To, to marry with your, your time of use rate. That's really good. And uh, I, I think it's important when we talk about electrifying our home and you know, we're gonna get into renewables in a moment here, but I think it's interesting to note that all of these solutions we're talking about are going to have a lower carbon footprint even if they're being powered with a coal fired power plant. So you may be getting your electricity from a natural gas or coal power plant right now and thinking, well, I need to wait for renewables before any of this works. That's not true. You can put this stuff in today. You know, the HVAC, the on-demand hot water, uh, induction cooktops, even an EV, and even powering them with coal-fired electricity is still going to reduce their carbon footprint. I saw a study by the, um, uh, I'm blanking on the group, on the, the, it's a concerned scientist group. Union of Concerned Scientists, on the yeah. Life cycle. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Union of Concerned Scientists. They did that study on the life cycle of an EV versus a fossil fuel car. And they found that over the life cycle, and that included manufacturing, running it through its lifetime, and then disposing of the car at the end of the lifetime, that the EV actually consumed 50% less, or emitted 50% less greenhouse gases than the fossil fuel car. So even if you're, you know, you're not getting renewables at home, all of these things you guys are talking about are going to reduce the carbon footprint, are going to help save the planet. And in many of these cases, it sounds like we're saving money, you know, lowering our utility bills monthly. Plus, they're more comfortable. They're just delivering a better quality of life. And so right, let's Bob. talk about how we. Um, I was go just ahead. going to add, Bob, you, you mentioned the Union of Concerned Scientists, and I would just encourage people to go to their website because they have, and for a number of years, they've had a map of the United States, and it's broken out by region, and you can actually see their estimate uh, from an emission standpoint of kind of what an electric vehicle, how uh, what an electric, what is the equivalency between an electric vehicle and a combustion engine vehicle in terms of miles per gallon based on where the electricity comes from in that region. And I don't think that they have the capability of showing that over time, but if they could, what you would see in our region certainly is that electric vehicles uh, are becoming cleaner, if you will, year after year after year after the penetration of renewables in our region increases. That's very cool. Um, I want to talk about renewables now. So we've been talking about how to electrify, and I think we should go ahead and do it now. Let's not wait for renewables. But, you know, in terms of getting renewable to our house, I think one of the things that's been around the longest is rooftop solar. And Ken, you're president of the Heartland Renewable Energy Society. Can you tell us about rooftop? Uh, sure. The uh, There's technically two types of rooftop solar. One is the most people, when they talk about rooftop solar, they're referring to solar electric systems, photovoltaics, PV. Um, the, that's the acronym is for, for photovoltaics is PV systems. And uh, they produce electricity by sunlight. And so uh, over the course of time, the, the efficiency has gotten better. The way that they're producing electricity, the voltage they produce has been going higher. So you have less losses. Um, they've changed the overall strategy from having one large inverter or the device that uh, changes the DC current, like a regular flashlight has, to alternating current, which is what happens in a home when you plug in a, 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 any kind of AC appliance. Alternating current uh, in our country is 60 hertz or 60 cycles a second. So it's a, a conversion process. But what, they, what happens now is a DC producing device, solar panel, or solar module, technically, uh, when it produces electricity, it converts the, the, the uh, conversion from DC to AC is actually happening at the panel in what they call microinverters. And so those combine, and there's several advantages to those. One, they're more efficient because they're located right at the source of the electricity, and so you don't have long 
uh, losses of, of, of metal wire happening is nearly as much. But if one solar panel or solar module per se goes out because of whatever reason, uh, a tree limb falls on and breaks, I don't know. You, you can just, there's a number of reasons why something could happen to one panel, one or two. In the old days, when you had everything connected to one inverter and you had a, technically a dead short or a panel go bad, it would basically take out the whole system or certainly reduce the amount of power coming out of it significantly. Now, when you have a, uh, in essence, a distributed system where every solar module has its own um, microinverter, if a panel goes out, then that, that panel's gone, but your change of how much power you're getting is not affected very much. And that makes a big difference too, because almost always, even when you have a clear shot at the sky on a roof, you may have a branch or a power wire or something over the course of time, work a shadow go across that. Old style solar systems, anything that got in the way shadow wise would really reduce the output significantly. Newer style microinverters, it doesn't really affect it all that much. So I'm, I'm kind of talking technically here, but what I'm saying is what you're getting these days for buying a solar system, you're getting a lot more power output from the same amount of square footage of roof area. So it's a good investment and the cost of course has come way down. But I don't know if that's exactly so become more right. efficient. Oh yes, the efficiency yeah. up, up quite a bit, and that I think will continue to happen as more, uh, uh, you know, as time goes on and people do experimentation and, and innovation. And then of course, I wanted to do rooftop solar. I wanted to do rooftop solar. I mean, I, I'm a consumer. I want to put solar cells on my roof. Um, what's that process like? You know, what what would I be looking at in terms of of time frame, labor, cost? Well, used to be a rule of thumb was about $2 a watt. And so if you put in a 10 kW or 10,000 watts, it would cost you $20,000 for the system and installation. That was a basic rule of thumb. I think we're approaching, I don't think we're down to a dollar a watt and someone in the average group probably could give you a more specific uh, answer to that. But I think we're closer to the dollar per watt. So the price has come from $10,000 for 10 kW system, or excuse me, 20,000 down to around 10 maybe 12, but the uh, the real key in all this is, and we'll, we'll probably talk about a little bit, is storage of the electricity because most of the time people put in a solar system thinking they're gonna save quite a bit of energy and save quite a bit of money, but the people who put in the systems work during the day. And so while the system's most efficient and producing power, nobody's home. And so um, the time that they want power when they get home at five or six o'clock or whatever it might be, and it's starting to get dark, the, the power coming out of the solar system is going away. The demand on the power itself for them to turn on the electric appliances, like we're talking about lights, heating and cooking, and then it goes up. And so you're having to rely on the utility, or, or your, which in essence, your utility, electric utility, such as energy, is your backup system. So one of the bigger savings for people over the course of time is if they especially gone during the day is some kind of a system at home, a battery system that stores the energy during the day. So when they turn on the lights at night, they're still using the power they paid for and produced during the day. And so that's another way of looking at this. I may not still be answering you exactly what you're asking though. Oh, well, that's good. And I know batteries and battery technology, I mean, that's almost a subject when itself, the battery technology is becoming so much more powerful, both in our EVs and for homes, you know, the, the Tesla batteries and things like that. Um, maybe we can touch on net metering because I, I know in a lot of places, you're running those solar cells during the day and you're generating electricity that you're not using, but that can be fed into the grid and actually reduce your electric cost that meter running backwards. Um, one of our Evergy people address that. I mean, does Evergy provide net metering for local um, rooftop solar users? I don't know the exact rates, but yes, we do uh, provide net metering. Mm -hmm. So you're actually getting paid back for that solar power you're generating during the day. And then at night, you're going to pull energy from the grid. And um, so yeah, it seems like a solution whether you have batteries or not. That there is, there's, that's, without getting into any kind of philosophies or whatever, true net metering is when you get paid for the amount of, in other words, if you're paying 12 cents a kilowatt hour during the day for peak times, then you get 12 cents a kilowatt hour for any energy you put back into the system. Most of the time that doesn't happen and there's reasons for that. 
but normally you're looking at what they call avoided cost or, or basically wholesale versus retail pricing. You've got, you pay retail uh, during the, the, when you buy power and power you're putting back is wholesale power. And, and it makes sense to some degree. A lot of people who put in solar systems think that's unfair, but utilities can buy power at a wholesale rate from, from the grid, from other utilities that have an excess amount of power or things like that. So what they're basically trying to do is still have some money coming in from even if you're producing it as a as a as a producer, they need to have somewhat of a profit uh, factor to be able to maintain the the utility poles, the lines, to pay the linemen and all that. And that's a whole other discussion, which I don't think we want to get into now. But let's just say it this way: as things progress, we get into more distributed energy systems where more and more homeowners put solar on the roofs. One of the considerations utilities are looking at is at what point does this start becoming uneconomic for us to maintain? the infrastructure. And so, um, and like I said, that's a tough one, but, and I, I want to talk about rooftop solar, one other quick thing, and maybe we want to move on. So I don't want to take a lot of time, but there's also another type of solar system that's relatively common, but not as common as solar electric and that solar thermal where you heat water or you heat air. Air systems fairly unused, at least around in our United States. Electric, uh, excuse me, water or uh, thermal systems that heat water more common, but still not as common as solar electric or PV systems. And so the only point I want to make if people are watching this and they want to get some kind of a quick handle is that conversion is where your losses are at. And any of these folks from Evergy or anybody that works with electricity or any kind of energy source, if you have to convert one type of energy to another, or in the case from a solar electricity to heating water, there's some losses. Um, but if you can heat water and then use that heat water to heat water for water use, it's pretty efficient. So, um, so there's time, there's times when you can design a, a system where you heat water for your water heating needs. You heat, you use, make solar electricity for your electrical needs. You store electricity in your battery for off times when you're going to want power, but it's not daytime, things like that. So it's just kind of a strategic way of looking at it just like electric utilities have to plan for seasons and all, they're gonna need more power in our part of the world for summertime when everybody has their air conditioners on than in the wintertime when most of the demand for energy is either for lighting or heating. But since there's a lot of, again, talking our part of the world, a lot of heating is done by gas. It's not as much of a demand on the utility as it is in the summertime. So homeowners are doing a smaller version of that if they understand by using the right energy source at the right time utilities look at it as a yearly or broad spectrum. Well, let's talk about utilities. And I, and I think the, the, the Cadillac, uh, I mean, our gold standard will be delivering renewables through the grid through our public utilities. As we notice on the drawdowns, their, their top solutions was utility scale when utility scale solar. Um, and, you know, I, I know like IPL Independence Power and Light, they've been providing solar energy to their customers for some time now, various degrees of success, and other places are buying wind energy, Ameren's buying a lot of wind energy and building, building these wind farms. Um, Katie, perhaps you can talk about Evergy. Tell us, you know, where your renewable programs have been and where they're going. Sure, yeah, just to provide a little background. Um, so Evergy is focused on growing renewables while retiring our end of life fossil fuel plants. So today nearly half of the power we provide to homes and businesses is emissions free and emissions free power includes renewables, nuclear and natural gas and oil. And of that emissions free energy around 30% comes from renewable energy, mainly wind. So today as an Evergy customer, you 30% uh, of your power is already renewable. Um, and we do have, Evergy does have one of the largest wind portfolios in the United States. And then we also recently announced a plan to increase our renewable energy called the Sustainability Transformation Plan. You might have seen some, something about that in the news. So the goal of this plan is to reduce our carbon output by 80% by 2050. And, and one way we plan to do that is by adding you know, more renewables, whether it be through wind or solar to serve our Kansas and Missouri customers. And then um, if you want to get into the, the products that, that you as a, a customer can participate in, um, we have two. Um, for the residential customer, we have a product called Solar Subscription. 
And that's a product that gives customers the opportunity to support solar growth without having to install those solar panels on your own home. Um, so basically with that, you subscribe to shares. Um, you can do up to 50% of your, your annual usage in Missouri and up to 100% in Kansas. Um, it is a premium product, so it will increase your bill probably around five to $15 more a month, uh, depending on how much you offset. But um, we are 90% subscribed in this program, um, 1,200 customers almost. So it, we can go, go out to build, uh, bid to build the array. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, we hope to have it the first solar array live uh, mid-year 2021. And then um, for the commercial customer, we have a green tariff product and called Renewables Direct. And for those of you who don't know what a green tariff is, it's basically just a price structure, a special utility electricity rate that allows larger, larger commercial and industrial customers to source um, up to 100% of their energy um, electricity from renewable resources. Um, so, so with our product, Renewables Direct, uh, mainly the customers signing up for that, they're, they're, they want a path towards their own sustainability goals with their companies. So we're providing that path with this product. Um, and we have two wind farms online for that program. And um, the city of Kansas City, Missouri, and uh, there's other Kansas City metro cities, are, they're participating in that program. So they're pretty excited about that, that opportunity to participate. Um, so I know a couple of years ago, I was um, talking to Kansas City, Missouri, and, you know, they were excited about getting into that long-term contract for your green tariff. Yeah. And I'm hearing, so as individuals, if we want renewable, then the um, solar subscription, mm -hmm, and, right. you know, we can get from 50 to 100% of our electricity from the, wind or from the solar farms then. Solar. Uh -huh. I'm also hearing you saying that from solar, and I'm also hearing you saying that 30% of our electricity right now is wind. So even just sitting here today, running this laptop, mm -hmm. one third of this is being powered by renewable. That's correct. So that's yeah. great. What, what's, what's the trend you see going in the future? I mean, is the, the renewable portfolio going to increase? Yeah, we hope to um, on our um, legacy West Star side, you know, the, the Kansas side of the territory, we have a, a wind product right now for our residential customers. And it's, it's kind of like the solar, but it's just for wind and where you can subscribe by a percentage of your power through wind, you know, up to 100%. So we're hoping to provide that maybe on the, uh, the KCPL side, the legacy KCPL side of the in Missouri and uh, the Kansas City area also. I, I would like to ask a point of clarification here real quick. I guess I'm playing devil's advocate again, and I apologize for that. But I believe I heard uh, Katie say that they have zero emissions from wind and from oil and from gas. She if, said. And well, I emissions... know that you're trying to clarify. There's a reason you said that. But most people who listen to this say, hmm? so would you clarify, please? Yeah, we um, just consider we can consider emissions-free power the the ones that aren't coal. So for us, every emissions-free power includes not only the renewables but also the nuclear, the natural gas, and the oil. So we consider that emissions-free power. Okay, and admittedly, to to touch on Ken's point, there's a lot of environmentalists that don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, yeah, that, that, that's technically the point is. For, for another discussion but yeah okay but it, it, makes, probably, it makes sense from a utility point of view but from people who just say that like i did and i'm sure james Owen from renew missouri is going um hmm. so anyway continue please so so james let's jump to you i know renew missouri's into policy and you know taking renewables forward at the government state levels you know where are things at and where are we going well, it's, it's an interesting time to talk about, it, especially with Evergy, because uh, right now Evergy has, uh, we're kind of in the process of getting their integrated resource plan uh, that's going to be discussed before the Public Service Commission, their 20 year plan that's going to discuss a lot about what we've talked about. Um, you know, I think what's going to be interesting with that, and, and not just seeing the goals the company has set uh, and the increased win that's going to go online. Uh, or the, the wind that's already there, as well as the solar. I think all oh, that's great. I think Evergy's making really uh, great progress of that. Um, you know, some of the other things that your, 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 your audience might be interested in is some of the concepts the commission has asked all of the utilities in Missouri, not just Evergy, but also Liberty Empire down in Joplin, 
as well as Ameren over on the eastern side of the state is to look at things such as the concept of a virtual power plant. And this kind of goes into some of the some of the topics we're talking about where individual solar and storage units on different houses, businesses um, can can be used to uh, buy the utility to call up power whenever they need it. So it's not just something that's going to be used by the individual um, property owner or the individual business owner. It's something that the uh, the utility can help control to provide power to other parts of the grid. Um, I know it is something that Evergy has on their shareholder side invested some money into uh, some development of technology for that. So that would be something that potentially um, that that the utilities could have an interest in. So you could have solar panels, you could have distributive energy resources on your property that there's a there's an ownership uh, from the utility, which I think is is very interesting. And I think it's something that we're really supportive of. And I know that a lot of utilities around the country have looked at it. Um, we think it's got a lot of potential. And also another thing that's going to be looked at in, in that uh, plan that's been requested by the um, regulators is a cost of solar study, which is something that we've been trying to advocate for for a number of years because there's with all these controversies about wholesale versus resale, um, about what what economic stressors that's putting onto uh, the utilities grid, the utilities equipment. There, there's really never been a, an external uh, examination of how much solar costs people, how much it's worth. And so the, uh, the Public Service Commission just in the past month, uh, I believe they, they started talking about this about a month ago, they, um, they, they said they want all the utilities to look into those two topics among other things. Um, and so we think that that has an, a, a massive amount of potential from the policy perspective to transform how we talk about uh, how utilities interact with their customers in the next 20 years. I can tell oh, you, well, set up. Oh, I was gonna say, by, okay. because, because we, we interact with people at the Heartland Renewable Energy Society quite a bit, people have a tendency as Americans to say, if a 5kW solar system is good, a 20kW solar system is better. And so in essence, what they're doing is buying way too much solar. Mm -hmm. And so it's not because they couldn't use it, but what it comes down to is you'd only use it at a very peak time and everything in your house is on your dryer and everything else. That's where you're going to hit 20kW. The odds of you having your dryer on, your electric oven, your, all your burners on your stove and every other power device at the same time, pretty slim. Realistically, homes use the alternate power goes, you know, thing, something might turn on, something else will turn off. And there's a sweet spot between 5 and 8kW. 10kW system is actually a little big in my opinion, but analysis can be done. And so there is excess power out there. And that, that's all I want to add to what James was saying is that the virtual idea is that there's a lot of dormant power that could be tapped. Um, so that, that's all I got to say is we, we tend to buy too much. The American way. James, in, ter in terms of the legislation, our, our both Kansas and Missouri side, is our legislation set up to support this transition from new towards renewable? Or are there legislation legislative actions we need to take to make renewables ubiquitous? Oh, I, I think there's, I mean, I, I think right now the utilities in Missouri and Kansas are making that those strides. We need to make it a little more um, a little more streamlined. We need to make it a little more cost effective. Uh, one of the things that our group has pushed in Missouri and Kansas and that, um, you know, utilities are starting to look at this and, and, and it's a very serious thing we need to talk about is how we're going to deal with uh, stranded assets left by coal plants when we shut those down. Um, Evergy has, you know, made efforts to shut down some of their coal plants uh, as well as other utilities in the state. Um, there have been some challenges with that. They've, um, as a matter of fact, I just learned about a case last week where uh, the Western District Court of Appeals said that um, Evergy was going to have to assume a lot of the costs that went along with closing down their Sibley plant there in Eastern Jackson County, which I know is, is, is a frustration to Evergy. <clears throat> and it's a frustration to us because we want this to be an easy transition. But there is a way to monetize uh, those stranded assets to monetize the debt that's in those coal plants. It's a concept called securitization uh, that we're trying to push not only in Missouri, but also in Kansas. 
Uh, it's used in several other states to help uh, utilities address unforeseen costs. And we'd like to see it as an option here in Missouri. We think that uh, if utilities had that as a tool in their toolbox that they could take before the Public Service Commission, it would make the closing of those coal plants not only easier, but cheaper for customers. It would be cost neutral, in fact, because I think a lot of people, especially a lot of environmentalists, when they talk about, well, we need to shut down coal plants, we need to do this, we need to do that. There's not a lot of conversation. And, and to, be, to be fair, it's not their, it's not their point of view. Uh, that they're that they're supposed to be taking, but it is it is going to have to, someone. It's going to have to come from someone's pocketbook, and we and and ours our hope at Renew Missouri to work with the utility companies to try to make that uh, less of an economic burden on all the parties involved. And so I think that's a big one uh, that the Missouri legislature and the Kansas legislature can tackle, um, and I think that will help make a big transition from coal to um, renewable sources. And I think that's something that's not. Uh, it's not, a, you know, an overarching, it's, it's not a big, it's not a big policy that you had to take. It's not something that's going to cost a lot of money, but it's just an, an option that utilities would have uh, that to make that process easier. So we hope that can get passed and we would like to see the legislatures pass that. This has really been a good session. I know I've learned a lot. And I, I want to thank all of you for being with us. You know, we've covered a lot of material. A lot of this information is available in the education system at the Climate Council's website. So I encourage everybody to go to the Climate Council. That's www.climategkc.org. Um, James, people want to learn more about um, Renew Missouri. Where can you send them? They can certainly go to renewmo.org. Uh, sign up for our e-newsletters there. We're also on Facebook. And Twitter, just look for RenewMo, and uh, you should be able to find us. I'm also going to be reached at james at renewmo.org. I don't have any problem with anybody emailing me there. Ken, how about um, people that want to learn more about Renewable Energy Society? Yeah, the website is probably the best source of information, and that's at heartlandrenewable.org. And uh, uh, if they do that, they go there. There's email addresses available, so I won't go ahead and give one now. There's <clears throat> ways to contact the board or, or, or specialists in, in different areas of solar, renewable, clean energy. Thanks. And Katie, where do people go to learn about Evergy's renewable products? Yeah, um, Evergy.com is our website. We have along the top, we have a ways to save tab and also a smart energy tab. Those will take you directly to our energy efficiency products and um, also our renewable products. And then you can also um, email renewables at Evergy.com and uh, we can direct you to the, the right source that you're looking for. Well, thank you. Thank you everyone. And thank you to our listeners. Please join us next month when the Climate Hour takes a deep dive into sustainable food, exploring the environmental impact of what we eat. I'm your host, Bob Grove. <laughs>